Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we will discuss treatment of children in the United States who are immigrants and refugees with Rich Limesider, Executive Director of the Safe Passion Project in New York, uh, Gladys Molina Alt, Director of the Child Advocate Program at the Young Center for Immigrant Children's Rights in Chicago, and Wendy Young, President of the Kids in Need of Defense or Kind in Washington, D.C. So thank you all for joining us. This is such an important issue. It has been out of the news, but it has not been out of the hearts of all of us who are watching the treatment of children who are immigrants and refugees. Let's talk about the world that children inhabit and, and talk about how we as a society are caring for those who are most vulnerable. Rich, let's start with you uh, and, Safe Pass and the Safe Passive Project. You are trying to uh, care in places where caring is so needed. Could you talk about your program? Thanks, Mark. Uh, thanks for inviting me here today. It's a pleasure to, to see and speak with all of you and a true pleasure to be joined by wonderful partners and colleagues in Gladys and Wendy. Safe Passage Project is an organization that provides free lawyers to child refugees in New York who are actively being deported by the federal government. I'm going to ask my colleagues to talk a little bit, and I'm sure they'll speak more excellently uh, later on, about the global situation and about children who have been arriving in this country over the past number of years. But suffice it to say that particularly since 2012 and 2013, tens of thousands of children, particularly unaccompanied minors, have been making their way to the United States on their own, fleeing violence, persecution, um, challenging situations. And many of those children, over the past several years, uh, the largest number of those children actually wind up in New York. They have a friend or a family member in New York who's willing to take them in. And so tens of thousands of children have arrived in our area after coming to this country by themselves. And the law is extremely clear for these young people. If they are fleeing persecution or if they have been abandoned by their parents, there is a place for them in the United States. There's no doubt about that. That's what our law says and has said for quite a while. Mm -hmm. uh, the challenge is that the process by which they can recognize those rights is deeply complicated. It's more complicated than doing your taxes by far. It involves multiple government agencies at the state and federal level. It involves a mountain of paperwork. And so a long-term study from Syracuse University shows very clearly that when a child is trying to pursue their right to stay in the United States, uh, if they don't have a lawyer, they have only a 17% chance of making it through that process successfully. But if they have a lawyer by their side, they have an 85% chance of making it through that process. And so we are extremely proud of the work we do at Safe Passage Project. We win 90, 95% of the cases that we have a chance to work on. Um, but the real opportunity is simply to have a lawyer by the side of that young person. And the challenge is for many of those who are watching today, if you've ever seen a police drama, you know, most of us are familiar with the idea that you know, if you get arrested, you have the right to remain silent, you have the right to an attorney. If you cannot afford one, one will be provided to you. We all know this. Well, in the United States, that's only true in criminal court, in tax court, in divorce court, and in immigration court, if you are too poor to afford a lawyer, you don't get a lawyer by your side. And so at Safe Passage, we are currently 40 staff people focused in the New York area, 25 attorneys on staff, but incredibly 500 pro bono attorneys uh, working with us uh, day in and day out on behalf of 1,200 young people who are trying to make their way through this process. And our every expectation is that 90 to 95% of those 1,200 kids will wind up with a path to citizenship in this country. There's another 3,000 young people in our geographic area alone. And our goal is to not only reach success for the 1,200 kids we're working with, but to go take on those 3,000 as fast as we can. Gladys, why should we care about uh, children who cross the border illegally? We should care about the mark because they're fleeing violence. They're seeking safety in this country. In this country, asylum laws and other laws and the, the Immigration Nationality Act still afford protection for kids and adults that come to the United States seeking protection. So we, 
should be mindful about whether we are upholding the rule of law at the border when it comes to these kids and their families and adult immigrants as well. So paying attention to what the government is doing and using a pandemic to cover an agenda, um, it's something that we should be paying attention to and whether we're really abiding by the rule of law when it comes to kids arriving at the border. What you're saying is that is that actually the rule of law serves a purpose of justice, right? And, and if children are fleeing uh, persecution and violence and criminality, and they've taken this type of risk, the law is actually, and this is, was Rich's point, right? The law is that we should care for them, particularly as adults. We should just care for children who are not uh, coming as, as uh, just as a way of earning a little bit more money. They're coming because of the distress that they're experiencing at home. So how, how does your organization, uh, the Child Advocate Program, function to help those children? Yeah, so we run a, a national child advocate program at the Young Center, Mark, and we have over, uh, just a little over 60 uh, staff members that work um, as uh, on cases uh, across uh, eight of our offices in the country. And we serve as child advocate for kids that are in the custody of the Office of Refugee Resettlement, meaning kids that were transferred to the custody of the Office of Refugee Resettlement by Border Patrol or ICE, and um, kids that have been released from that system. We also go on to help some of the kids that are released as well. And essentially our job and what we stand for at the Young Center is that in decisions affecting immigrant children, the best interest of the child should be considered. And not just applying immigration laws that were designed for grown-ups to, to children, but rather to bring this other analysis called the best interest that we apply to children in family court, in children's court, and any other decision-making process that affects children. And so we make recommendations to folks that make decisions like the immigration judge, the asylum officer, including the Office of Refugee Resettlement with issues with, to, with regards to placement, with repatriation, with pursuing legal relief, uh, with release from custody or preventing a child from going into ICE custody when they turn 18. So we make recommendations as to what is in the best interest of the child with regards to those decisions. Wendy. Are you also providing the same type of services that Gladys describes and that Rich described, or are you, are you taking a different approach? Uh, we're actually located in 16 cities across the United States and um, very much value our partnership with Rich, with Gladys, and, and other nonprofits across the country who are really trying to help these children navigate what is a very complex immigration system. So what we do is work with over 650 major law firms, corporate legal departments, law schools, and bar associations to match volunteer lawyers with these children. And then we train those lawyers who pretty much practice in every area of law except immigration mm -hmm. on how to help those children through the process. So we do that through our expert immigration lawyer staff across the country. And as Rich said, the difference that a lawyer makes in these children's lives is extraordinary. Um, kids who are represented by counsel are five times more likely to be granted some relief and the ability to remain. The, the laws under which we are operating have become increasingly complex under the, the current administration, but even in, with that, we're still winning about 94% of our cases. Our youngest client was four months old. Um, can you imagine a four-month-old appearing in a formal courtroom proceeding and being asked to present a defense against their deportation from the United States. I mean, literally, it's, it's impossible. So the lawyer really is the lifeline for these children. You make a very good point. The, these organizations have so much in common, and, and they, they derive their commonality from the situation of, of, of children, right? They, they are children. They have particular needs. So beyond the, the issue of legal representation within a court setting, can you talk a bit about, from a, from a real technical perspective, how you view your representation of children differently from representation of adults? Because the laws are very similar, but they're not identical. 
And then the ch children have different needs. They have different needs for education, for safety. They are, they are far more dependent. Um, Gladys, why don't you take this one in terms of, in terms of that, that real difference? Yeah, I think, thanks, Mark. That's a great question. I think um, the big difference is the vulnerabilities of kids and it, it's, and their ability to be able to convey things. They remember things in a different way than maybe grown ups do, just timelines, like in, in law events and what happened and details are central to uh, any legal case. And so that is a fundamental difference. The other thing, too, is the way that, say, persecution appears to you know happens to a child and, and it and appears through the eyes of a child can be different than that of a, of, of a grown-up and and again just the vulnerability the vulnerability as an immigrant in the united states but also vulnerability in, in home country and um and their inability to to make certain choices for themselves um back home and um and just like like the way that i look at this is children who are facing the removal process in the United States and the immigration process here should not just be treated as an immigrant, but also as a child. We've decided as a nation that we afford that, that sanctity in every other process in which we make decisions about a child and it shouldn't be different for a child that happens to be an immigrant. We just uh, completed a poll in which we queried why people think that children cross the U.S.-Mexico border in particular, along with their families. And the, the most votes uh, came from escape from violence, and second most was escape from poverty. Rich, in, in your experience, uh, what, what are the reasons that are driving uh, particularly uh, the, the presence of children in the United States? Overwhelmingly, the young people that Safe Passage represents um, and the young people that have crossed the Mexican border over the past number of years are children from what are called the Northern Triangle countries in Central America, places where uh, there has been widespread government failure. And in large portions of the country, the government is not able to protect huge swaths of the population. I want to point out that um, on the one hand, we, I'm a father of two children. My son is 12 years old, uh, you know, well into adolescence, soon to be a teenager. I was a teenager. Um, I wasn't an innocent as a, as a teenager, so I want to make sure that we also don't, you know, uh, uh, overemphasize this notion of, the, of sort of the, the young, uh, th that children are only worth protecting if they can demonstrate their absolute angelic nature. Uh, I know I don't hold my kids to that standard, and you know, uh, very few of uh, people I know here in the United States do. Um, children are different. They have different brains, different uh, expectations. And so um, they come with uh, real lives lived. For the most part, the young people that we see um, are fleeing the worst of the worst. You would not undertake a thousand mile journey on foot which many of our uh, young clients do. They take a bus when they can, they hop a freight train if possible, unless you were truly fleeing uh, the worst of the worst. And that's what's going on for a lot of these kids. Well, angels sometimes don't survive, right, Wendy? That's absolutely right. Um, and the kids that we work with are incredibly resilient. They've suffered trauma in their home countries. They've suffered a very difficult journey to the United States. And they've had to navigate a, a system in the United States in a, <clears throat> under a set of laws that they are completely unfamiliar with. They're held in federal custody for a period of time before being released to families. And sometimes they haven't seen those families for years. Um, but I think the, the commonality among the kids we work with is they are children. Um, and we have to meet them on their terms. We have to ensure that the system can accommodate their unique needs as children, as, as Gladys and Rich have outlined. Do we have anything to fear from these children? Uh, to me, the biggest fear is that the United States uh, backs away from its long-standing and very proud tradition of offering protection to refugees, including some of the most vulnerable children in the world. You know, it, any expectation that um, uh, that nothing bad can ever happen from any uh, huge and diverse group of people is uh, sort of outrageous on its face, I would say. But to me, the greatest thing we have to fear is the loss of our own humanity. The notion that we as Americans could ever somehow violate those fundamental principles that our country was uh, built to aspire towards by you know, putting children in cages, by separating them from the arms of their parents. 
uh, what that does to the humanity and the spirit of all of us as Americans is my greatest fear. On the Statue of Liberty, there is this inscription, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless tempest tossed to me, I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Now, the, the real question to me is, what is America? What are we going to be about? And can we just be for ourselves, for the people who have already entered through our uh, forebears, whether we were uh, natively uh, born here or came as immigrants, whether we are uh, native to these shores or came in from Europe or from Africa or from uh, South and Central America or other places. Um, what, what does America mean to you, Rich, when you and, and Gladys and then Wendy, that you would spend your time, your life, your livelihood on helping people who are not Americans. What does that mean? <laughs> I believe in this country. I believe in the United States as an aspirational set of values. I know that we have not uh, ever fulfilled those values, but that's the whole notion of what it means to try to form a more perfect union, not to ever be that perfect union when we can rest on our laurels or even worse, look into our past and say, oh, we were there, we were done, let's go back to that. To me, what America means is to be constantly recognizing our faults, uh, acknowledging, but then moving and striving together. And so uh, I think for us, the opportunity to be that country that is not only the land of the free, but also the home of the brave what it means to actually boldly do the right thing, to understand that it doesn't always necessarily mean you know, the easiest or the most wealth producing decision uh, in every moment, but that we stand by those values. They have worked out uh, you know, very favorably for the United States over many hundreds of years, but that's not the reason. You know, we don't support immigration. I don't support immigration only because of the uh, positive economic consequences as much as I may believe in them. I support in them because I support the notion of immigration broadly, not just for the children that Safe Passage Project serve, because I believe it's so closely aligned to my aspirations of what it means to be a citizen of this great country. I guess you're saying that, that meaning comes from care, from how you express care for others um, in, in a way that doesn't necessarily accrue to personal benefit, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and Gladys, in terms of how, how you see America and our, and, and our heart, what, what civil society should be, um, how yeah. do you do this? This is a very personal question for me, Mark, because I came to the U.S. from El Salvador in 1990 when I was 10 years old. I came from El Salvador from a region where it was the heart of the Civil War, where I saw kids blown up when they stood on, my, on, on landmines. And um, soldiers walked into my grandma's house with, um, with guns in the middle of the night. And so when I came to America at that age, it meant the world to me, Mark. It meant safety. It was the country that had given my dad amnesty and allowed him to bring his kids here. It meant the opportunity to be part of a free society. And to me, my, in my heart and in my brain and in my, everything about me, America, America is a place of kindness, of openness, of contribution to my life. I, I became an attorney here when my, par when my parents in El Salvador never even got the chance to go to school. They didn't know how to sign their names. So to me, America really has enabled me to achieve my full potential as a human being. And that's exactly why I do the work I do because I believe that there are other kids too who have potential. And I'm so proud to be an American now. And I'm so proud to contribute to this country and raise a, fa raise a family here and be able to show the world that we are a country that has so much that it can be generous and that we don't live in scarcity, but rather in plenty and that we are defined more by our kindness than by our fears. And plenty is defined by an act of will, right? I mean, plenty does not necessarily mean wealth. Plenty means mm -hmm. the ability to share what we have. Uh, Jesus did it. Um, 
Gautama Buddha did it. There were others who created community within scarcity. Uh, Moses walking through that desert and ensuring that everybody could stay together. And all, the, all these other traditions. Wendy, we just took a poll in which we asked whether we Americans are doing right by children in the US or immigrants and refugees, and 94% said no. Um, we also had some people who, who believe that, that uh, we are doing right. How do you see this, this, uh, this issue? Are we in the United States as Americans doing right by people who are not Americans, who are children who land on these, these shores? Well, I, I'd like to, to just reflect on the hopes and aspirations that, that Gladys just so articulately uh, stated. It, it's a work in progress, um, but the United States is at its best when we learn from ourselves. And um, certainly, um, having worked in this area for about 30 years, we've made improvements over time, but boy, they've been incremental. Um, but each step of the way, we've learned, okay, we need to do this better, better procedures, better laws. Um, I feel right now we're at a uh, a very critical point in our history where we need to decide what do we want to do in, in the future and what does that mean for children, mm -hmm. both immigrant and refugee children, but also our own children. What kind of country do we want to build? Mm -hmm. What kind of country do we want to live in? You know, when, when, when you ask a cross-section of Americans how many people came, Gladys, as you came, um, so many of us are, are like that. My, uh, my uh, parents on my father's side would have been dead. Um, and my dad would have been dead had he not come as a refugee and not been accepted here. Uh, the same can be said for my grandfather's side who came as a refugee from the pogroms in, in, uh, in uh, Georgia and in, um, in the Ukraine. Um, how do we change things in a way that uh, help us to be um, faithful to that tradition. It seems like we um, are constantly forgetting whether one comes from Scottish forebears uh, coming back into the 1700s or, or 1800s, or whether we come more recently from uh, South and Central America, from that golden triangle that you were referring to, Rich. We seem to constantly forget that it was our families who, whose lives were on the line uh, previously. Mm -hmm. Is it a matter of civic education? Is it a matter of advocacy? Is it a matter of change laws? Is it a matter of Supreme Court de decisions? How do we move forward? Gladys, could you just uh, take this initially? Yeah, I think it's a matter of, a, of a small things, right? Like to, to what Wendy said earlier about the incremental changes that have happened, they've happened through litigation, they've happened to direct representation, they've happened to collaboration between nonprofits um, and organizing movement. So I think it, it's change that happens incrementally, but ulti ultimately, Mark, I think we're in the social conversation around immigration. And I think that there is a lot to discuss within that conversation, right? Um, from many spectrums, but I, I think it, it's taking time to understand why people come what protections they need, and how can we make immigration work for for everyone, essentially, right? Um, because I'm not I'm not going to say that there isn't a debate to be had around um, immigration. It, th there is, there is, but it, it it takes us understanding what is really happening so that we can think it make informed policies along the way, and not from a place of um, fear. And, and certainly not from information that may not always be accurate about, about um, immigrants. What do I do about having a, a fear that America becomes less familiar to me, that people are speaking a language, not English, that I don't understand, that people around me eat different foods, and, and it's not the America that I grew up with, Wendy. How do we deal with that, that issue? Because mm -hmm. there are real concerns about changing the culture of this country um, that, that really do need to be addressed. It is not sufficient to say those concerns are not our concerns. Change is inevitable. Um, you know, people are worried. How do, you, how do you deal with that, Wendy? Sure. Well, I think that the um, first 
to remember our own history that we are a, we are a country largely of of immigrants and that each wave of immigrants that have come into this country have encountered difficulties and communities who have brought them in, in into their midst have encountered difficulties but working together as a community we can resolve those challenges uh, and I think that you know it's, it's kind of the notion that um, as people become more familiar with each other things become easier they problem solve together um, and what I find in uh, my public engagement is very often people are like well you know immigration, um, you know, when you talk about it in numbers, they're, they're, they're fearful, they're worried. But when you talk about it in terms of their neighbor or um, the individual who's taking care of their children um, mm -hmm. or, um, you know, their colleague at work who came from another country, then people start to, to kind of open their minds to it, I think, a bit more. So we need to embrace that and also create those moments for community. So there's not mm -hmm. as strong a sense of this. There's also a, a, a really interesting statistic. If you take a look at a country like Germany, they have proportionately welcomed many more uh, refugees and immigrants uh, per capita than we have. I mean, for us, it's just a, just a tiny smidge. Even uh, prior to this, uh, to this attempted lockdown, um, we really have, have had a very, very small cluster of people compared to other uh, countries. Uh, Rich, we just uh, finished a poll in which 95% of people suggested that we should uh, welcome all immigrant children. And there were a few people who, who believed that we should welcome immigrant children only if they flee violence and political and other, other subjugation. How, do, how can you, you distinguish a, a, a refugee um, who, um, who uh, flees violence and the and, and a refugee who doesn't as a child, how do you how do you make that distinction, or is it a false distinction? Is this really about about subjugation and violence and and uh, and fleeing um, uh, um, a, a a fate that um, that needs to be turned around for all for all children? How do you, how do you see this? Well, Thanks again for bringing us all together, Mark. One of the things I appreciate about this is the chance to have these kinds of conversations. You know, at Safe Passage, our, our actual day job is making sure that federal forms are two-hole punched properly so that the government doesn't reject uh, the green card application. So to have the chance to actually speak at this level is, is deeply energizing. Um, one of the most brilliant writers on the topic of children coming to this country is a woman named Sonia Nazario on Wendy's Board of Directors. And Sonia has said on multiple occasions that all this fear of the wave of immigrants and particularly the wave of immigrant children is ridiculous because at best it's a fine mist. When the total number of children who want to come to our country could fit in a single college football stadium, I'm not even really interested in having the conversation about what the number should be. Let's, let's you know, when, when, it's, when it's something that really has, you know, so little impact on the, the economic and absorption and other concerns, th this is a group we really should just be able to uh, put a button on a website, put myself out of business, let all these lawyers find something else to do, um, and just get these kids living happily with their families. You, you make such an important point, and I was inexpertly trying to get there. You know, our fears seem to be unfounded. Our fears seem to be based in, in these anxieties that are constantly being driven through messaging. But we're talking about a tiny number of people. We are talking about uh, violence that are driving people to make these thousand miles uh, journey. We do want to take care of kids. Um, you know, at a certain point, Gladys, we should just be doing it, right? I mean, that's, this is Rich's point, right, Wendy? I, I completely agree. Um, the reality is, is, as Rich knows, in addition to those, those two hole punches, we're operating inside some of the most complex laws on our books in the United States. And the requirements that these children have to meet are extraordinary mm -hmm. in order to be able to stay here. And again, without the assistance of a lawyer or an advocate through the Young Center, there's no way these children can make it through this system. So we are a long way from what Rich is uh, uh, suggesting. Yeah, and whether we like it or not, Mark, that making those distinctions about what, what reasons they came from and whether those reasons fall into these legal buckets of protection that we've created is still the, the framework that we have in place, and um, that's why we're here. <laughs>
And it's important in closing, we're going to give you the last word, Gladys. It's important in closing to remember these, these young people have been tempered. They've gone through difficulties. Mm -hmm. They are smart. They are survivors. They are people who have built this country through history. So we should welcome them. We should make them Americans. And we should benefit, benefit from their efforts like we have with all of you. Gladys, uh, Molina Alt, Wendy Young, Rich Linesider, thank you so much for sharing this really important topic with us. That's the nonprofit report. Everybody stay healthy, mask up, and, and thank you so much for attending uh, all attendees. Have a great day.